am so excited about our kickoff speaker this evening. This picture of him shows him in movement because I think this man is always in movement. It started when he and his family moved from China to Illinois. Uh, in Illinois, then he became, I think, also interested in rockets and movement and NASA, uh, which led him, hopefully, uh, to come to UC Berkeley, where he studied industrial engineering. Um, and boy, did he start moving after UC Berkeley. He went to McKinsey, uh, which uh, is pretty much the premier of any consulting company, a place to be. But that didn't seem to be enough. Then he was at eBay. He was also at Square. He just kept moving. And then got his MBA from Stanford. And while there, and I think it was during a class, came up with uh, Silicon Valley Delivery, which became DoorDash. And if you haven't heard or used DoorDash, it is only five years old. It has grown to over 1,000 cities. It's recently been in the news because there was a Series D funding for $500 million, led by SoftBank and Sequoia. And then, I think last week, there was another round of $235 million. So I can't wait to talk to our speaker tonight on what's going to happen with three quarters of a billion dollars. Please welcome to the stage Tony Hsu from DoorDash. impressive class at 6 30 and or whenever it started and and there's there's a packed house this is a Do you I mean think I, I knew that's probably cow bears are always night owls but um, you know not typically for class at dinner time so this is this is impressive thank you for coming well thank you for being here and so as you may have heard usually we kind of talk a little bit about your journey and then about your business and you have been interviewed um, I would say just like the growth of your company, this exponential like one-on-one -on -one interviews and on these large stages. So thank you for making time for us today. And I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey and how you got to Cal. Sure, so uh, you, you covered some of it. I mean, I, I grew up really in the cornfields of Illinois. So I, I grew up in Champaign, um, Illinois, which is a, a tiny college town, big university. Uh, not too dissimilar from from Berkeley, um, although you know, growing up, I was one of maybe three Asian kids. So maybe that's like a you know pretty big difference. Um, but 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 twenty or so years ago in in Illinois, uh, life was was quite different. Um, and I, I I didn't ever think I would ever make my way actually out of Illinois. You know, um, typically my friends growing up, um, you know, we would stay in Champaign or Urbana and and um, stay at the university there, for example. You know, my dad went to school there. He later taught there. Um, and I only really got here uh, because in high school, um, really I would say out of a uh, midlife crisis, my dad decided to leave academia um, where he had tenure, which is, which is a bit of an atypical decision um, to kind of effectively change his entire career. Um, my dad was a very talented, um, engineer and understanding how to take heat out of systems. He was actually one of the designers for the space shuttle Endeavor. Um, uh, and he effectively drove himself across the country, um, walked up to the reception desk at Intel, asked for a job application, and got a job two days later. And, and that's really how my family and I made our way to Silicon Valley. Um, I kind of came here in the middle of high school. So uh, that was a bit of a, a shaky transition at first. But, you know, California, as they say, is the last state you move to. That so far has been true for me. I've lived half my life in Illinois, the other half out here, uh, and, and I've enjoyed every second of it. And um, when I had the chance to, uh, you know, go to school, it was, it was actually Cal or school on the East Coast. And, um, you know, it, it was really hard to say no. Uh, to, to Cal, just um, I, I would say really m more for the breadth, actually. I had no idea what I was going to do, but it was really the breadth of things that I thought you could study here that really got me. So you graduated a little over 10, a little, wee bit over oh, 10 seven. years ago. Yeah. Um, when you when you were growing up, um, I am kind of curious. You said that your dad, I mean, obviously he was a big risk taker and he came out to Intel, but I think your mom also was quite influential. I'm, do you mind talking a little bit about that and what you did for your mom? Yeah, so I, I grew up in a classic immigrant um, 
uh, family situation, uh, having immigrated from China, where we came to this country with two or three hundred dollars in the bank, and uh, so my dad would uh, pay his way through school by working as a waiter on campus um, at this campus restaurant called Hendrix House, where he worked forty hours a week while getting his PhD. And my mom would work three jobs uh, uh, to to kind of make it all work. And and one of those jobs was actually at a restaurant. And over the years, you know, she started as a as a waitress, but then um, you know uh, later got more involved in the restaurant, became a general manager. And um, I guess at the uh, tender age of nine, I, 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 I became a dishwasher inside her restaurant. And uh, so nothing glamorous, but I got to do that for seven years growing up as a kid and um, really got to, got to see what it uh, was like running, running a, a restaurant and also, uh, frankly, just you know, running a business. My mom still, to this day, runs a business. She actually later on sold her stake in the restaurant and opened up another business. But um, yeah, my mom is certainly a very incredible business owner. And so, do you remember how it was when you, did you, did you have to declare a major when you first came to Cal? Did you know you were going to be an industrial engineer? Is that how you could think of I yourself? I think you had to declare. I didn't know what industrial engineering was. I, I liked math, so I thought mm -hmm. I, I was going to study, and at the time, industrial engineering had just moved out of the math department, actually, and into the engineering school. And that's largely why I didn't know what industrial engineering necessarily was. I, I think I applied... Um, applied math, um, but someone last minute convinced me that there's some other courses that might be interesting. Um, really, it was the, the engineering curriculum, the, the core curriculum for, for those of you in it, you know, the first couple of years or having gone through it. And so that was, uh, that was how I ultimately, you know, found my way into industrial engineering. It was really just from a love of math. So when you're taking classes here, did you start to think that maybe, I mean, like now, every, a lot of people, 50% of people probably think about entrepreneurship, at least in this class, which is probably a high number. But yeah. ever did you, I mean, your mom, you saw what she was doing. Anything that kind of clued you in that maybe that would be a path you might want to take? So, so I never actually uh, had the intention of starting a company. Um, even when I was in grad school, where, where DoorDash ultimately was founded, didn't have the intention or interest uh, there either. Uh, but I, th I think looking backwards, this is one of those things where it's easy to connect the dots, you know, uh, looking at your past and, and a bit tougher to, to figure it out in the moment, which was um, I, I, I was always very comfortable with, with my own skin and, and thinking independently. Um, I pursued lots of different things while I was here at Cal. I was, um, I was the student advocate, you know, I, I, I studied math, I, I pr pursued cancer research, um, I liked history. Uh, <laughs> Um, I had a lot of various interests, and I wish I could have taken actually more courses. Um, it, the engineering school at the time, I don't know if it's much different now, uh, but didn't give as much latitude over um, the courses you could take, especially in the first couple of years. And, uh, but, but, but I had a lot of varied interests, and I think I was always very comfortable taking independent um, lens. Um, I thought I was gonna be a lawyer when I first came to Cal, even though I studied math. Um, then I thought I was gonna be a cancer researcher. Uh, actually, I thought that way even upon graduation. And mm -hmm. the McKinsey thing was a very big 180 for me where even to this day, I think my mom wonders, wonders whether or not I, I worked for McKinsey or, or McDonald's. I <laughs> So um, it is kind of interesting. Well, I mean, you did all sorts of stuff, but you also, how did you keep yourself sane in school? Yeah, I, uh, I, I think I always had a pretty strong work ethic. So there was always, you know, the, I always found a way to make fit, you know, whatever the schedule were. And I was always impressed by, frankly, my dorm mates, to my floor mates, to um, classmates who were doing all sorts of things, you know. Uh, I, not necessarily starting companies and things like this, but they're doing all sorts of things. Lots of people paying their way through school. I was I was part of that cohort, um, and and so I think I was you know was a pretty good um, uh, self-driven person in that regard. Um, I, uh, I, I, I I mean it was just following some basic routines. It, it was really how I kept myself sane. Um, were, you, were you playing basketball in college? Played some basketball in college. Um, uh, 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 you know, uh, and, and did all the things that you know you, you're supposed to do. Yeah, um, in the sense that you know hanging out with your friends um, uh, to God knows when. You know, in the middle of the hour, of the night, but. Uh, that, 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 was all, that was all, I mean, the first year of college still in many ways was probably the, the, the best year um, that, that I remember for a while. Uh, 
Any haunts from Cal that you uh, still would want to go back to? Haunts? You know, I'm thinking Smokehouse. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I I think also I I um I didn't I, I came to I also typically do this um even now I, I've always whenever I enter a new environment um I, I don't really go in with that many expectations um and uh I so I, I had no real um, expectations of of college or of Cal um and it's it's actually very similar to how I approach uh, things today. And, um, and, and then, you know, I'll, I'll form certain points of view and then, and then you know, the, the points of view will either prove out true or, or, or not. But I, um, no, I, I had a fantastic time at Cal. So it's interesting you went to McKinsey, which was a pretty st stable company. I'm curious to know what you were doing there and how maybe that influenced you in, in some other steps. Yeah, that was never part of the plan. You know, I, I think that in in many ways, one of the things that I've always, you know, ha has been stuck with me since I was a child was um, because I um, because my parents worked so much during my childhood, I didn't see them as much. So, so part of growing up was was raising myself a little bit, and um, yeah, and I, I've always had you know this kind of life motto of. Um, of where am I going to have the most fun and the least regret? And and you know Cal was that for school. And then you know after graduation, I thought I was going to go and pursue this graduate degree in, in cancer research actually. Um, and I you know made the terrifying decision uh, on graduation or nearing graduation day to actually um, decline um, that offer. And uh, and it was a terrifying decision because I actually had nothing in my back pocket. So I, I had no alternative at the time. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't exactly what my parents were expecting on graduation day. Um, uh, the McKinsey thing kind of came through as I was, you know, surveying what my friends were doing. Most of them actually in 07 were going to um, become engineers at Google. Um, a few went to Facebook at the time, uh, and and you know they they were you know trying to convince me to do this. Um, but uh, one of them actually worked at this place, McKinsey, and um, I didn't know anything about McKinsey, and that was actually what intrigued me most about it. And so back to my life motto of where am I going to have the most fun and least regret, it typically comes in an area where I know very little about. And um, that's actually ultimately how I joined McKinsey. It was really on a whim. I, I didn't know much about it, um, but it, it turned out to be one of the best, um, I, I would say, you know, training grounds for business for me. What were some of the things that, I mean, since you've had the engineering or maths background, and even with your cancer research, what did you think that you learned at McKinsey business-wise? I learned, I mean, it's really, it's, it's much akin to college. You learn a way of thinking. You know, when I, I mean, day one, I showed up in t-shirt and jeans. That was not exactly protocol there. So the first thing I did at McKinsey was actually the recruiting team took me to Macy's and we went shopping. Um, but. Barring that, you know, the, the, the second, third, fourth things that it taught me were uh, how do you take a big problem and break it into, you know, um, its component parts? How do you communicate um, those parts to different people within a company? How do you take uh, what you've communicated and actually turn it into something that hopefully will be valuable? Um, it, it really was a, a way of thinking, and, and, and it was, again, all different sectors. I worked in technology, I worked in airlines, I worked in nonprofits, I worked in railroads, I worked in a hospital. So uh, I just I want to make sure we spend enough time on uh, DoorDash, and, and I'm curious to know how you made the decision to get to business school after doing McKinsey and at some other companies, and then the beginning of DoorDash. Yeah, so, so uh, again, I mean, the, the, nothing really ties it. I mean, it reads nicely on a sheet of paper, but, but nothing really was in, 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 in entirely planned. Um, after McKinsey, it was really about, again, that you know, most fun, least regret um, kind of principle. And it was really about following great people. So I followed a person named Bob Swan, who was the then CFO at the time of uh, eBay at the time was eBay, PayPal, and Skype. It was this almost parent holding company of three businesses, and I was trying to figure out what to do with each of the businesses, and got a phone call from someone representing Bob Swan, the CFO at the time, 
that was why I decided to join eBay. Um, and actually, at eBay was really where I learned, um, where I was first introduced, I should say, to the world of startups. Um, eBay in 2009 was trying to make a decision about what to do about mobile. So the the App Store came out in 2009, uh, no, 2008, really. And then in 2009, everyone, especially large companies, were trying to figure out their mobile strategy. And eBay was looking at some smaller companies to potentially invest in or acquire. And so you know, I, my task was to study five or 600 of these companies. Companies. We ultimately made a few acquisitions, one of which was a company called Red Laser. It was an app on your iPhone where you can scan the barcodes of products and we would tell you where you can find for the cheapest price. Um, I w later on was asked to run that um, business for eBay and that was actually my first real quote unquote entrepreneurial journey. I uh, didn't ask to run it, uh, um, but uh, but. It, 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 but learned quite a bit from it. Actually, got, got a little tired at the end. Um, we, we took it from a um, very small download base of 50,000 users to about 12 million actual real users on a weekly basis in a year. And um, that was when I decided to take a break. Go to, um, and and I, I did that by, by going to business school. Um, that was your break. That was my break. I, uh, I you know, I, my, my, I was, I was voted in the first year of business school most likely to drop out. So I, I, I was very close, very, very close, um, in, in between my first and second years of, of school there. Um, why, why would you have dropped out? Well, so, so business school for me was was a delay function. You know, it, it, it wasn't a. Um, in hindsight, you know, you can question that. Th that, but um, for me, it was again. W where am I going to have you know fun and and not regret the decision? And and for me, it, 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 it was this almost investment in, in myself and learning not really too much business. Maybe learning more um, uh, some of the softer uh, skills in, in certain courses, and that was really w what I saw it as. And, uh, and, and, you know, an opportunity to, to um, I was working for Square at the time. Square at the time was a very small company um, of about 100 people. And we're working out of um, the SF Chronicle, the San Francisco Chronicle building. And, um, it, it, you know, one out of three swipes would be working. This was a very different time for the company. And I was thinking of working there full time. And that was why I almost dropped out. Ah, interesting. And uh, so... <laughs> you're working there full time, and you're going to business school. Sorry, I'm trying to like wrap my my head around. Yeah, this. I mean, I was working. The, I was working. I worked there full time during the summer, and then into my second year. So there are a number of engineers in the audience, and um, we, you hear about softer skills a lot. What are those softer skills that you felt like you might have learned, which was you know accounting or finance? Uh, the the hard skills, I mean, or the. Or I thought you were saying it was kind of taught you some softer skills. Yeah, the softer skills. Yeah, so um, <laughs> it, it, it's very hard sometimes to learn it in a classroom setting. Um, but it it, it it was my first exposure into um, frameworks on how to have a difficult conversation with someone, um, whether it's someone you work with, someone that you report into, or someone that reports into you. How do you um, how do you get two people who really dislike each other to work together? Um, I'm sure you get probably plenty of practice in groups here, but um, th this is this is actually trust me a, a very important skill over time. Uh, how do you get someone to um, believe what you have to say when you really have no evidence uh, or data showing for it? Um, those can are I, some. Can I stop you there? Yeah. So how how do you do that? Yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> You know, I, 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 I think the one thing you can't fake, and, and you know, I know there's a saying, you fake it until you make it, but I think the one thing you, you, you don't or can't fake, and, and that is unique actually to each one of us, is um, uh, what we believe. And, 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 and because we tell, we may believe in certain similar things, but we probably have slightly different life experiences and points of view that led us there. And, and, and I think if you're just yourself, that is the best way to be able to convince somebody. And and over time, um, you know, you, you have to show progress. Um, it, it, it's easy to have somebody believe you maybe the first time, but um, you know, the, the second, the third, the fourth, et cetera, You know, those things take uh, incrementally much higher levels of um, evidence. Can you talk about that relative to DoorDash or or sure. Silicon Valley delivery? Yeah. So you know, I, I, I think when we started the company. Um, uh, 
there were really three things that, that that was not obvious to me um, when we started the company. I mean, when we started the company, we had no interest in delivery and we had no interest in restaurants. And really the motivation was from a want to help local businesses. It still remains the mission of the company today, which is to enable anyone to become a local business one day. And that's because local businesses, even in this day and age, produce 60% of the jobs in every city in this country. Um, it's been actually fairly constant, that statistic, since the 50s when they started measuring this. Um, and, and for us, the three things we didn't know were, uh, it, we, after having sp spoken with a few of these business owners, were, you know, why, why does no one do deliveries? You know, some of these business owners were turning down 10 to 15 orders a week. They all happen to be delivery orders. And it, it made no sense. I mean, it's very un-American to reject a credit card. And, but, 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 you know, in, in their defense, you know, the only city that does delivery is New York City in this country. Everyone else really does not do delivery. And it, it's not like a rocket science concept. It's been around since humankind. And, and, and so the, the first question was, well, you know, do people actually want this? Um, it, or, or is this just a New York City thing? Be, because after all, it's a free country. Anyone can start a business. Um, it, so it, it, if typically when there is not that business, it's because no one cares. Um, so that was the first fear. The second one was, um, is this, uh, uh, you know, are, are the drivers who might be attracted to the type of work here, are they only interested in money? If they're only interested in money, then, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we might as well not start the company because it, uh, it's obviously more valuable to transport a human than a burrito. So the ride sharing people are going to go get all the drivers if, if that were the case. And the third and final concern when we started was would merchants with these restaurants actually care and pay us enough to keep the company alive? And that was it. That was really kind of, you know, what the business was founded on. It was founded on, you know, answering those three questions. So it wasn't really much about convincing other people. It was about convincing um, ourselves um, first and foremost. And if the answers to those questions were true in, in, a, in a positive direction, then we were going to start, um, it, we're going to continue. And, and if they were false, we probably never would have started DoorDash. How did you start to find those answers? Uh, well, we ran different sorts of experiments for, for each one of them. The most important one was actually the first one. I know it seems obvious that you get everything delivered. That's just not true. You know, um, even today, only 3% of restaurant sales are delivered. And 95% of the time, we're not competing against other companies that you may have heard of. We're competing against a telephone call um, or you walking into a store. Um, and, and so, you know, the very first thing was on a weekend, we, you know, my co-founders and I built this very janky website. Um, it was called paloaltodelivery.com. Uh, not a very scalable URL, but a very cheap one um, that you can buy and register in minutes. And, um, and all it was were eight PDF menus, um, a Google voice number that rang my cell phone, and, and, that, and that was really it. It was probably the worst possible experience from a user experience perspective. Um, but, you know, the test wasn't, you know, how low friction the UI was. The test was if we offered restaurants that never offered delivery before, would people care? That was it. We sent it to a couple of listservs, um, and, and, and that was really, you know, the first test. Didn't someone order within an hour? Someone ordered within 45 minutes, but that was more luck, you know, than anything. That was a great, that, 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 that was awesome that we had that. Someone ordered within 45 minutes. Um, and it wasn't one of you all. It was not. It was someone who, uh, you know, Google Google doesn't index, you know, the, the, uh, the, the URL that quickly. So the only way this individual would have been able to find us was literally to type in Palo Alto Delivery into the browser. And that was, that was you know, our guess as to how he found us. Pretty incredible. And who did you start the company with? I started the company with um, co-founders from Stanford. And are they all similar backgrounds? We all hear different stories with, about who you're supposed to found companies with. Yeah, so so um, I have a few points of view here. So so they're the, the, uh, they're from uh, computer science as well as business. And and you know I think the thing I would say is um, I, I wouldn't. Uh, over rotate on uh, you know s skill matching. I know this is one of the kind of common things that um, is quote unquote best practice. You know, one of the things I found more useful over time is that um, you're going to have to learn lots of skills. And most of the skills you don't, you won't have at the beginning of your journey, especially as you, if you decide to continue the journey. And 
and, and so what's more important is people that you really can see enjoying working with, where you'd work for one another for free. I, I think if you pass that test, um, I think that's a very uh, healthy start. Um, that that's worth far more than if you know you're a great um, engineer on the back end and someone else can build the front end. You know, while that's nice, I, I wouldn't say that that's quote unquote necessary. Um, I would say that it's probably more important that the two of you feel like you can go through um, ups and downs more so than you know any other you know skill overlap. If you have that, that's nice, and and that certainly does not hurt. Um, but that that was one of the things that you know we had a. Uh, we had agreed on, I think, pretty early on. How did you make the decision then? Like, okay, let's let's make this. Let's try to make this a viable company. Like, what are the milestones? Well, yeah, I, I think it was, it was just a step at a time. You know, the, the the summer that summer when we launched June of 2013 was when DoorDash was founded and, and launched. Um, it was answering those three questions. That was it. And we were doing very, very little volume. You know, there wasn't much data necessarily, um, uh, but there was enough information to answer those three questions. And that was actually what we cared about. It wasn't necessarily, you know, we, we launched out of this um, incubator, Y Combinator in Mountain View, and, you know, we were, we were not the most successful on quote unquote demo day, which is the culmination of, of, of that program. Um, but, we had enough confidence and conviction based on the answers to those three questions that we thought it made sense to continue. After that, it, 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 you know, everything was really uh, trying to figure out what the right next milestone was. For us, the next milestone after that um, was figuring out could we make actually the economics work in one market. Um, after that, it was could we make. That was San Francisco. Was that, that wasn't first? actually ah. no. I mean, the, the first city was. Um, was actually in East San Jose. It was in a few neighborhoods in East San Jose. And one of the biggest fears we always had was, well, look, we launched the service in Palo Alto and Mountain View, which is where um, Y Combinator uh, uh, is, is located, um, but it's not a very great representation of the US. You know, I grew up in the middle of the country, uh, very different, uh, uh, you know, social demographics there. And so we wanted to find the closest market that would give us conviction, positive or negative, whether this could be mass market. And the one closest physically to us was, was in San Jose. So that's, that's where we launched. So as you've built, I mean, now you're in, I think it's over 1,000 Yeah, cities. we're in about 1,200 cities today. We'll end the year around 2,000. Any of those cities where you were like, yes, we made it? Not really. Um, so, so, I mean, the, 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 the thing, uh, you know, I, I, we, we really, again, you know, one of our core operating beliefs is really to, to, to you know, start and think from first principles. And, and once we figured out what made a certain type of city work, we kind of had this formula we knew. And it was just a matter of, you know, where to tune up, down, sideways, um, the formula. I'm not saying that we got it right in the first year or the second year or even have it perfect today, but we, we know enough about it where we know how to tweak it to make any city work. And um, that, that, that's why it, it was less about what was quote unquote surprising. I think what was surprising was just um, how many cities this works for. Um, and that was, you know, that's the biggest thing that you don't get to control as an entrepreneur, which is the timing of when your market opens. Um, what international cities are you in? We're in, uh, so we're, we're in a few cities in Canada, Toronto, Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I mean, really, it is an incredible story. And so now you hear all the stuff what Amazon's doing, or, you know, you've got Grubhub, you have Uber Eats. Mm -hmm. Is your strategy, are things changing as you've got bigger and bigger competitors? Again, not really. Um, you know, you know, day one, the strategy was always um, we're going to build this company for merchants, and um, and, and so you know, I, I, I think it, it can get very, very dangerous when you start getting nervous um, when other people come in because typically the reaction is you will do what other people do. And, and it violates a lot of what, um, it, or goes in the face of many times what is um, against why you started the thing in the first place and, and, and also what makes you special. And for us, it was always first and foremost about 
how do we build the most sophisticated, you know, delivery system, whether it's 10 minute, you know, ice creams or 30 minute burritos or hour long groceries or, you know, name your favorite type of um, item to get delivered. Um, start there. That gives us the opportunity to offer, you know, deliveries from any merchant, which allows us to then actually keep, to start a relationship with them and build more and more services for them. Delivery is the first one, but we'll build other ones. Um, and, and one day allow, you know, you as a consumer to interact with a merchant in many, many different ways. Even if we gave away everything for free on DoorDash, you're still not going to order delivery 20 to 25 times a week, even though you eat and shop at least that number of times. So it was always about, you know, I, I, I think being very stubborn about that perspective. Um, and then, um, Making sure that you know we had you know enough capital and resources to compete, and and but 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 sticking very firmly to that point of view, um, which is very different from what we see in the market. There are two things I want you to talk about before we turn it over. Um, one thing is that you are a stickler, from what I have heard you say, for detail, and so you just talked about delivering ice cream. Um, I, I know that you've gone, you work with the Cheesecake Factory. I think that you all have gone through hoops also to deliver cheesecake without having it mushed. Can you actually tell us about something that's hard to deliver and how you all figured out how to deliver it? Sure. I mean, so, so the, the, w w one of the other operating principles we really believe in um, is, is how do you operate at the lowest level of detail? You know, the, one of the things that a few people recognize about the offline world is that it's well, two things. One, it's 10 times bigger than the online world. And two, it's probably thousands of t times more complicated. Um, you know, um, maybe, you, uh, maybe you do get upset if, if your Instagram photos takes a little bit longer to load. Um, but, you know, I, I could tell you for a fact that there are many hangry customers with us tonight, right? And that, you know, every night there's a thing called traffic. There's a thing called rush hour. When there's a thing called rain in California, people go crazy. Um, and, 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 and these are, you may call them like just, you know, daily life, but that is the world in which we must take all of that information and digitize it and make sense of it and then actually do something physically. And, and so, you know, just to give you an example, if we wanted to deliver cheesecake um, from uh, the Cheesecake Factory in, in, in one of the areas, uh, there isn't one here in Berkeley, but there is one in San Francisco at the mall. It's on the sixth floor of the mall with no parking. It's one of the, it's, it's one of the most difficult things to do. To get that one thing right, we had to figure out, well, how are we going to get parking, you know, dedicated to the dashers, these are the drivers in, in, in their cars or scooters or bicycles or other vehicles. Um, how do we get dedicated parking? How do we figure out how to, you know, get to six floors of stairs very, very quickly? Well, there's a mall elevator that only gives access to mall employees and now dashers on the DoorDash platform. Um, okay, uh, how do you collate food from three different stations without making a mistake? Uh, what systems do you have to talk to in order to do that? Uh, how do you reconcile issues if somebody decided to add avocado to an order? Um, these are all the things that we have to do just for one order, just for one restaurant. And, you know, doing the deliveries ourselves w w is, is really one of the things that um, has, has gotten us to where we are. And, 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 I, and I could say that about many things. I could say that about doing the accounting ourselves, doing the marketing ourselves, doing um, effectively every facet of what we do is really how the company has gotten to where it is. So even today at 700 employees, everyone at DoorDash does deliveries once a month customer support once a month. And, and that obsession over figuring out every single little detail um, is ultimately why we have you know, 70 of the top 100 restaurants in America signed up. That's more than all of our competitors combined times four. And, um, and, and, it, and it takes a lot to get it right. And, and you may think that it's not scalable or it's not customizable or it's too customizable but that's the reality of the world we live in. That's the offline world. It's, it, it, there are no perfect clean APIs um, or structured data sets that you can get your hands on. Um, but, I, but I think what's important is, is not necessarily what we do, but what's important is what you must do in, to solve the context of your problem. Whatever the problem is, maybe your problem is simpler. Than, than the offline world. That's awesome. There's nothing like good or bad about it. Just understand to the lowest level of detail what you're trying to do 
and then understand for each of the different customers you're serving, you know, what they care about. I'm wondering if you can finish our fireside chat off talking about delivering good. So we started this company, um, again, five years ago, really for people like my mom. You know, I told the story of my mom a little bit at the beginning of this conversation. Um, what I didn't tell you was that, you know, she never wanted to be in the restaurant business. Um, she was a doctor in China, but when we emigrated to this country, her license was not recognized and we didn't have the money to put her through school. So she worked inside of a restaurant for 12 years, saving up enough money so that she can actually open up a medical clinic, which is what she now does still in her 24th year at the medical clinic. And, and, and if you think about it, it, it's an incredible story of someone who effectively had to learn everything all over again. You know, medicine and English, or Western medicine, I should say, um, how to learn English, you know, how, how to learn how to open a business, blah, 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 blah. Um, how to do that in the restaurant world and then later on in, in, the, um, in, in the clinic side. And, and, and it's really about always connecting people and their potential. And that's really what this company is about. Everyone at DoorDash, there are over 46 entrepreneurs who work at the company. There are over 70 folks who used to play sports at the Division I level, um, a couple of Olympians included. And if you think about these people and what they care about, what motivates them is being the best version ultimately of themselves. And that's really what we view for all the dashers, the 450,000 drivers on the platform, the 200,000 merchants, and, and now tens of millions of, uh, of, of, of consumers. Um, and, 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 and for us, um, you know, any opportunity we have to be able to do that, um, you know, we, we will. And so January 15th of this year, we launched, um, uh, we actually launched our brand for the first time. And as part of that, we told, um, uh, you know, this story of, of, of why we're doing what we're doing and, and, and the fact that these businesses that we're trying to serve, they're really delivering good for their cities by creating 60% of the jobs. And how else can we actually deliver good? Um, well, one, one tactical problem we decided to solve was really with food waste and hunger. Um, so about four or five billion, depending on the count on who you, whose data you take, you know, of food is wasted every year. Um, a big part of that is coming from the restaurant world. 99% of these restaurants would love to deliver the excess waste that they generate on a daily basis, including from, you know, cafeterias and, and, and the like. Um, the challenge is that they have no way to bring this excess to the food shelters, um, the, uh, the food banks, and, and the community centers that may need the food the most. And so, you know, we launched Project Dash, um, as, as one example of how to, you know, take some of the things that we've done and built to solve a, you know, a, a real problem in, in some of these cities. And so in places like New York, LA, Chicago, Bay Area, we teamed up with um, dozens of local food banks, hundreds of restaurants, and, and, and effectively um, are delivering with the dashers on the platform food waste on a daily basis. And we're going to save about 10 million meals this year. Um, and, and be able to give that to people who really need these meals. And, and we also announced a partnership to memorialize some of this work uh, with Feeding America, which is the, who is the nation's largest organization in trying to solve this problem. So we're powering that for all of um, their cities as well. Uh, this is just one example of, you know, I think how you can take technology and, and something basic um, like logistics and actually solve a pretty hard problem um, and, and, and do some positive things for the city. That's pretty incredible. So um, I, I thank you. And now I'm going to let it leave it open to the students. And it would be fantastic if you could say your name and maybe what you're focused on or what your major is. And there is a um, microphone. We'd like you to use the microphone. So why don't we start here in the middle aisle? Uh, hi, my name is Sally. Um, I'm trying okay. to go into business or economics and cognitive science. And my first question was, it seems like creating a company can be super daunting just because there's so many things that you have to focus on. True. And I guess when you first created your Palo Alto delivery.com thing, like you weren't really focusing on like user interface and stuff. So I was wondering, um, how did you know what to focus on first when creating your company? And do you have any advice looking back on that now? Yeah, I, I think the way to always take a thing that sounds daunting, you know, is, is to break it up in, into its, you know, uh, uh, 
discrete parts. And and one of our beliefs at, at the company is any project you start, you always start small. Um, you know, for us, what that means typically is we'll start in one city before and figure it out before we scale it across um, all of the markets. Um, and we won't really we won't really do that in, until we've figured it out. And and so in the beginning, for us, it wasn't about how good the product looked or any of that. We actually had the belief that. Um, if we could answer these three questions, we'll be able to figure out what the right solutions are uh, to, to make it look a certain way, to, to, to have um, drivers care about it in a certain way, and, and to have restaurants pay us in a certain way. And, and, and really, it was um, just trying to answer those three questions. Um, and again, I, I think the thing that typically prevents people from starting companies or from continuing their entrepreneurial efforts early on is the belief in themselves. And, and I think that starts if you, if you can have a point of view that you believe in. And not, not, not many people have to believe in it with you. The only most important thing is that you believe in it. And um, if you do, then, then it's probably worth pursuing because at the end of the day, it's going to be up to you and your team to convince others. But you have to first convince yourself. Right here. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, it was an amazing conversation. So Kyle and fourth year undergrad, um, undergrad and MCB major. So um, going through your LinkedIn profile, you seem to be perfect for me. You know, like we've been talking about, you know, your so many like su successful experiences from Kyle, um, McKinsey, eBay, and then Stanford, and now you started your own company. Uh, so this is like a kind of personal question. Can you share with us like what is your biggest failure in your life so far? Oh sure. I mean, uh, th th there are failures in all of those things you read. I mean, I would not believe you know half of the things you read, but 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 uh, or, or the, they don't tell the full story. Let me tell you that. Um, many many failures uh, uh, daily, really. Um, and and you, you know my. Uh, Biggest failures. Uh, okay, well, they almost are always people decisions. Um, they because if, if you think about one of the things I, I think a lot about is um, uh, what is what is um, an activity or a person's output to input ratio. You know, if if uh, if you spend one unit of time, you know, a minute, an hour, name your name your favorite, um, or or, uh, or a dollar or ten dollars, or, or name your favorite. Um, what output do you create? And and uh, this is this is effectively the metric I use to judge myself in terms of am I doing a good or bad job uh, with where I'm spending my time. And typically, uh, where I find the highest, most disproportionate payouts is in people. In when, for example, in something like recruiting, the thing you should care about is uh, your dis proportion of payout, not your batting average. You know, we can hire three for 10 people, but if the three people are all, are all producing 10 times what the other seven that we made a bad choice on, um, then that's a fantastic outcome. And, and in, in many ways, life works that way. Uh, it also works the other way, when you make the wrong decision. Um, and it, it has this very large cost uh, and, and, and you're constantly trying to justify to yourself why your decision was the right one and things like this, but the better decision is to just um, move on. And, and, and it's not necessarily because it, it, you, know, uh, you quote unquote made a bad hire, it, it might just be because the environment is not a great fit for the individual. So most of my failures are, are with individuals and not being able to make work situation with people. And there are dozens of failures uh, in, in that realm. Hi, my name is Caroline, and I'm double majoring in statistics and data science. I just wanted to ask you about how, when you said you chose McKinsey, that you were thinking about the option that where you would have the most fun and the least regrets. How were you able to gauge how much fun and how much regret you were going to have when you had very little information on McKinsey? Yeah, it, 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 there's no perfect solution for these, some of these things, but um, uh, it was really generating my own points of view. I, I think one, it was. Um, there was a very uh, seemingly uh, impressive group of people there who all had these, you know, traits that 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 I I found um, 
define excellent people. They were um, they certainly had talent, but 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 they um they they were very motivated in, in in whatever it was they were pursuing. Not everyone at McKinsey is is cut from you know the same cloth, or, or frankly any organization. The military, Cal. Um, great organizations um, ha have people from very, very diverse backgrounds. Um, so one, great people. Second, uh, it was an area I knew nothing about. I, I didn't have any business experience. So I, um, I found that interesting because I thought in, in terms of the learning, uh, the, the, while, while it might be a little fearful in the beginning, I would actually learn a lot faster than if I were a software developer somewhere else. Um, b because I had some experience with that and I had done a little bit of that. Uh, not to say I couldn't learn more, but um, this was an area I knew nothing about. Those great people and you know where I can have the most, s the, the steepest learning trajectory, those are the areas I liked about it. Uh, my name is Bay. I'm a second year math and physics major. Uh, my question might be a little bit rough. I hope it's not offensive to you. Yeah. So in a hypothetical world, what if one of the dashers who have passed a background test, uh, like he's a dasher right now, but he commits you know, like a crime when he's delivering, how would you cope with that? How, how do I deal with that? Is that the question? Yeah, how would you cope with that? Because that would be like a scandal. It, right? it is a look. It, it, it is. It's certainly is something we we take very seriously. I mean, this you know, back to this comment I made about disproportionate payouts. This is like the same concept where you have a small percentage chance of a very, very catastrophic, um, or, or potentially catastrophic outcome, and the the number one thing I would say is you have to focus on what you can control. Um, you can't focus on what you can't control, and I think this is where people get nervous. I, I think there was an earlier comment or question, you know, from you, Victoria, around competition. Um, you can't control the competition. We can't control what a dasher does. Um, so instead, I'd focus on what we can control. Uh, well, we can we can um, we can control many things. You know, we can look at obviously we're the only service in the space that does two types of background checks. For example, um, a criminal check as well as a DMV check. Most people do the DMV check. Um, we uh, do uh, multiple, um, we, we build multiple um, probabilistic models of what we think might happen on a delivery um, before something goes wrong, before something is late, before a mistake is made, before you know, there might be an inaccurate order, um, if there's a dasher that might be in trouble, um, if location is not updating, or things like this. Um, if we notice, obviously, any sort of um, customer, merchant, or um, dasher uh, inquiry, you know, real-time inquiry, um, so we build as many signals as we can to, to 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 solve for that, and then we build very very fast response systems for very serious situations like what you're describing, um, and and that's really what it's about. It's a bit like um, it's a bit like what I would imagine air traffic controllers do, which is every day there are I don't know, thousands of flights probably in the United States, um, many of which might come in close contact with one another. And you don't want to wait until the planes crash and you put out the fire. You want to you know, make some decisions midair before the crash happens. But you also want to be very fast um, in the event that there is an accident. And, and it's something like that. Um, and uh, that's what we try to do. Hello. Oh, hi. Uh, my name's Kyle. I'm a third year EECS major. Great um, to you, Kyle. And I, um, so earlier you mentioned your YC alum, and from other founders that have come out of YC, they've all stated, or many have stated, that they've pivoted or or done micro pivots to change their direction mid YC and in that early process. Can you give us an example of how DoorDash may have pivoted, not necessarily in YC, but in the very early stages of the company? Yeah, so uh, I don't think we actually pivoted early on, but let me try to s see if I can give you a... Um, so, so, so our YC experience was, uh, what, what, okay, what, what did we do? We were trying to answer those three questions, and, and we worked pretty relentlessly in, in just focusing on that. So we pivoted our tactics probably daily, maybe hourly. You know, we, for example, answering the first question around um, would people care about this? Um, 
we had a whiteboard where every week, you know, uh, the person responsible, in that case it was me, would kind of founder split, divide and conquer the work, write down the 10 ideas that we were gonna try. And the idea that was gonna work, we'll double down the following week and throw away the other nine and then try, you know, 10 more new ideas. And the hope was that we'd find three or four by the end of the summer after trying about maybe 100 ideas. That's about what happened. We, we tried about 100 ideas and there were about three or four that disproportionately performed better than the other 90. Um, so that might be the best example I can give you um, where, where that was what allowed us to figure out things. Um, but I, I don't have a great example for you on, on, on you know, maybe changing completely our idea or anything like that. My name is Teddy. I am pursuing a degree in computer science. So was there ever a low point during the creation of DoorDash where things didn't seem like they were going to work out or if there was even just a very large problem? How did you help to turn that situation around? Many points. I mean, you know, the, I'll, I'll tell you uh, the, the very first one, which probably was the most likely to have ended DoorDash's, or, or shortened DoorDash's history by a lot was was really when we were coming out of Y Combinator, you know, coming out. So again, it, it was this belief that we didn't have a lot of orders at the time per day. We were maybe doing, I don't know, 70 orders a day, something like that, graduating Y Combinator. And um, as I mentioned or, or alluded to earlier, we were not the popular kids, you know, at Demo Day. Um, most of our peer companies were raising their seed rounds in, I don't know, like a week or two. We were 10 weeks in and we, we had about $10,000 left of cash in the bank and, and we were gonna run out of money, basically. And, and but, you know, remember at this point, we're, we're paying each other nothing. You know, I, I, I have a wedding in four weeks, my own wedding, um, I'm, I'm supposed to find a way to pay for. And, uh, and I, have, I have debt from, from grad school. And so uh, it, it was not obvious that we were necessarily going to raise our first seed um, round. Um, a few things, I, mean, uh, I, I would say, I guess general things, because I think there are some context specific things that, that would not apply, or I wouldn't want to just you know, make that advice generic. But I think the things that would generally apply, I think the first is, um, uh, do you still enjoy what you're doing? Um, Th that's an important, very, very important first question. Um, because the job changes, you know, and, and there are other moments later in DoorDash's life. At that time, it, it, it was, it, it would still felt like um, everything we had done from based on our own, you know, work uh, was worth continuing. And, and we enjoyed working together with one another. Uh, we enjoyed the early folks we worked with. Um, so that, that was an important question. Um, uh, second, uh, we, we try to hold, you know, kind of two simultaneously, it's two thoughts that were opposing one another, um, you know, at the same time. And, and so, okay, so on one hand, are we going to raise this round? On the other hand, are we not going to raise this round? Um, and, and, and could we argue both sides equally well? And, and, and it, it if you can, I, I think what it helps you do is it really helps bridge any conversations with people who are against you. Um, because, you know, one compelling communication tactic I found is, you know, you can say things, if you can tell someone, hey, you, you dislike us because A, B, and C. Well, did you know X, Y, and Z? Um, that is, that's a pretty compelling um, communication device if X, Y, and Z are true. Um, and, and I think, you know, when we did that for ourselves first, convincing ourselves, if we were the investors, um, you know, would we actually agree with this? Um, that was also true. And, and, and so for us, it, it, it was believing, um, in one another, enjoying, enjoying the work. And, and then I think having still a very articulate point of view as to why this was worth continuing, that ultimately got us through. Um, and when I look at the more, more uh, you know, the difficult points along DoorDash's road ever since then, whether it's, you know, future financing rounds or losing a recruit or um, losing a deal, 
um, or um, uh, doing poorly on a product that we launched or a market that we entered. Um, uh, it's the same like kind of thing. It's it, it's being very I think starting very intellectually honest about what has happened. Um, do we need to update our point of view? Um, are we just wrong? We're wrong all the time. You know, I'm wrong. I mean, I was wrong four times today uh, at, at the company, and 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 I, and I think not taking that part personally. You know, we might take our work personally in the sense that we care a lot about the outcome, but we don't really take personally what the right answer is. Um, and and I think uh, one of the things we found is people who only care about getting to the right answer, but don't care about who gets credit for the right answer, that gets you very, very, very far, especially in the dark days. Hi, um, my name is Julie, and I'm majoring in immunology. So the professor introduced you as someone who's always moving, and I think that's very characteristic of Cal. Um, so I was wondering if you stripped everything you did away what are some guiding principles that you live by? That I live by? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, geez, uh, maybe one day I'll, I'll say something more cogent um, uh, that I live by. Okay, so this is different. So in, at work, we, we have these operating beliefs, and there's maybe like 30 of them. Um, I won't spare you that. Uh, uh, it's too boring. Um, Things that I live by, okay, um, a few things. One, yeah, where am I gonna have the most fun and the least regret? That that, that still remains, you know, it's something that I, I think I lived by when I was a kid, when I was like nine or 10, and still something I live by today. I think second, um, uh, always try to see the best in people. And because everyone has a superpower, you just have to look for it. And a superpower is just someone's uh, skill that is superior to their other ones. By that definition, everyone has one. Um, uh, third, treat everything in life as a learning moment. Um, um, other things. Uh, four, um, typically the best or, uh, uh, or uh, most complicated problems are solved by people with diverse set of skills. Um, you know, uh, uh, Jill was telling me earlier that there are folks now taking, there's a data science major apparently, which is awesome, um, that, and there are folks from sociology or history um, uh, studying uh, data science. I think that's awesome. And that's exactly right, because that's actually how you solve the hard problems in the world. Um, and, uh, I, 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 and I think probably the, the last one I live by is um, how do you, um, you know, how do you hold two opposing thoughts at the same time? Um, and, 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 and how do you like constantly practice that? Uh, I, I, I think that, that can get you very, very, very far. Hello. Hi. Hi, my name is Jenny. I'm actually a recent grad from EECS. And after, I'm also born in China and moved here 10 years ago. And after hearing your story, I felt very inspired. And actually, I applied to DoorDash just now. Awesome. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so I want to ask, now, how I can help you contribute to the company and solve the big problems? <laughs> wow. Um, okay. <laughs> let's 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 talk afterwards. I I won't make this a commercial about DoorDash. I'll I'll uh, I'll, I'll um we, we can take the next question. We we can talk after this. So I, I think we can take, uh, we, we'll take two, two or three more. Two or three more. There you go. I'd also like to apply. <laughs> Great, plus two. No, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, right. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, my name's Eamon. I am a first year material science and engineering major here. And uh, coming into college, it's been like two weeks and I'm pretty lost on uh, whether I should focus more on improving my hard or my soft skills. So I wanted to hear your opinion on that. I, I wouldn't worry about it at, at, at freshman year. You know, I, 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 you know w one of the things uh, I, I um, I, I think undergrad is, if there's one thing you can get out of undergrad is, is figuring out how you best learn things and, and, and the things that you like and being proud of the things you like. I think a lot of times people in this world 
for whatever reason, are not proud of the person in the mirror. They, they instead listen to their parents, you know, or they listen to what's popular to study from their friends or, you know, I, I don't know, whoever they get advice from. Um, so I would try to figure those things out. What are the things you really like and what are the things you're good at? And, and lean into those things. I, I wouldn't worry too much about, you know, exactly what you're going to learn. You're going to forget most of it. Um, and, 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 and instead, if you teach yourself how to learn things, uh, like based on your authentic way of learning things, like not someone else's, um, that is, if you can figure that out, um, I, I, I think you've, you've done very well. Hello, my name is Mawan Franklin, and I'm a fourth year um, high school of business student. I wanted to know, um, is there any sort of licensing that you guys have to get um, to be able to run the business? Or is it like in, um, extremely government, government re, um, regulated? Ah, I see. Um, no, it's not, it's not very regulated. Um, it, it's, it's actually one of the, uh, it's, it's one of the, um, you know, probably the biggest open gray areas in, 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 frankly, all of probably labor economics and law right now, where there are tens of millions of, you know, folks working on platforms like DoorDash um, and, and, and many, many others. And, and they're, they're really no different from, uh, you know, actually consumers, if you think about it, 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 they care a lot about their time. They care about when they want to work and, and where they want to work. And, uh, the, the, the future of work, I think, is going to change towards that model. And I think it's, it's very scary to a lot of people. Um, uh, it, it's interesting. It, it's, it's actually becoming more and more like what we want and act like naturally as humans. But, but, but the legal systems um, you know, were not designed to support this sort of you know, flexible work. Um, so no, it's actually mostly an not or unregulated area. And, and, and I think that's why there are a lot of open questions um, uh, uh, about how to, how to make this work. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ching Ye Lim from SCET. Uh, I'm from China too, short-term scholar. I have two questions. One is, uh, partly you are solving the last mile problem. Did you think you can connect a uh, family to the maybe drugstore? Because family have emergency, maybe he just not only need the food, he need the uh, toy, drug, or, or something else. So you can extend your business category to other industry. Uh, that's the, the first question. The second is, uh, actually there are very, there are three uh, food delivery giants in China, Elema, Meituan, Baidu. Uh, each of them, the market value is huge. And uh, each of them are bought by Alibaba, Tencent, and Baidu. Uh, definitely presenting uh, their benefit, their interest. Uh, did you think uh, Google or Amazon will buy you? Because I think uh, basically uh, your business basically is data business because you are you have consumers' uh, preference, consumer preference. So you you have. Uh, each family's specific home address, I think it's, uh, it's valuable data. So uh, what are you gonna do with that data? So that's my second question, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, the first one's fast. I mean, look, if you can deliver ice cream in 10 minutes or groceries in an hour, you can deliver any of the things that you're, you're, you're talking about and, and, and certainly our goal at, at, at DoorDash is to deliver the world. I mean, we announced a partnership this April with Walmart, for example, um, delivering their groceries. And you can imagine that that opens up a broad range of uh, use cases. I think on the second question, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's a special time right now. If you think about um, 
or when I think about the types of businesses that will be very interesting, um, I actually think mostly of the offline world. Um, uh, this was even before starting DoorDash, mainly because um, if you think about it, uh, most of the consumer businesses in, in tech that have been built over the last two decades really have been in the online world. And, they, and most of that value accrues to a couple of companies. Um, and, uh, it, it, and, and it's very, I, I think, difficult to, to um, maybe break into that world, be, uh, uh, given how um, powerful some of their models work. But in the offline world, um, it's 10 times bigger. Uh, you know, even to this day, um, e-commerce is only, I don't know, eight or 9% of, of retail. Um, and in food, it's about 3% of, of, of offline. Um, I, I, th I think the types of interesting independent businesses that can be built, um, you know, have to do lots of lots of things. You know, you have to digitize the physical world effectively. No one's done that. And to your point, that data is going to become very, very valuable. Um, and so I think we have an amazing opportunity to build a very, very um, uh, helpful, hopefully, company um, to the cities that we serve. Thank you.